Hello everyone. Today we're starting a section on applications of nuclear physics. So now that we have some understanding of what nuclear physics is and how nuclear physics works, we can talk about some of the things that it's good for and perhaps bad for. So to begin with, we'll be talking about nuclear reactors. Nuclear reactors are a way of creating energy uh, or transferring energy from uh, the nucleus to something useful. So these are used in, for example, nuclear power plants. So as we know, Fermi created the first nuclear reactor, Chicago Power One, uh, during World War II, as part of the early stages of the Manhattan Project. So after the war, several countries realized that they could use reactors like this in order to create electricity, which, as I'm sure you'll agree, is a very useful commodity. So today's nuclear reactors are fairly similar to the original Chicago Power, but there are a couple of key differences. Um, so, uh, what do we use for fuel in a nuclear reactor? The answer is we can use a number of uh, fairly heavy isotopes like uranium or plutonium, but in practice uh, there's one main sort of fuel, and that's uranium, slightly enriched. Enriched uranium means that it contains uranium-235. Uranium-235 is more fissionable than uranium-238, and so is a better fuel. As you can see, it, there's not an extremely high proportion of uranium-235, but it's higher than what's found in nature. The pellets are embedded inside steel rods. So you get these little things in these long steel rods, and the steel rods are poked into the reactor. And once all the uranium pellets are inside, uh, there'll be enough critical mass for nuclear fission to occur. So nuclear fission of uranium produces uh, very radioactive daughter nuclei. We know from the, substance, uh, from the uh, theory of radioactive decay that once you get uh, fission, or in fact just the decay, you'll end up with a new atom. And that new atom tends to be quite radioactive and unstable. So the spent fuel is kept on the site of the nuclear reactor for a while, just until it cools down a bit and loses some of its radiation. And where does it go after then? Well, that's a bit of a problem, really. Uh, the disposal is still a bit of a mystery. People are still trying to figure out what to do with this spent uranium. I mean, do we bury it in the desert? Do we launch it into space? Do we dump it into the ocean? There are lots of solutions being sort of suggested, but none of them are really ideal. Uh, right, so with that out of the way, we'll talk about control rods. Uh, you will remember that there were control rods in Chicago Pile 1. So to control the rate of reaction, we stick control rods into the reactor. So what do they do? Uh, well, they contain cadmium or boron, which are fairly good at absorbing neutrons. And if we can absorb neutrons, then we can stop a chain reaction. So uh, these elements, the ones that are put into control rods, are able to control the rate of reaction, hence the name, control rods. Uh, a moderator is something that uh, Chicago Pile 1 used graphite for. And what it does is it slows the neutrons down. And why is this important? Well, if it, the neutrons are moving too fast, then they won't be absorbed by the uranium nuclei. And then the ura uranium nuclei can't undergo fission. So, uh, a good moderator has a small atomic mass because that means that it uh, won't become radioactive itself if it absorbs a neutron. And it should be able to slow the neutrons without absorbing them because that means that more neutrons can be absorbed by the actual fuel. So, Fermi Chicago Pile 1, as we know, used graphite as a moderator. We can see a whole lot of graphite blocks in this photograph over here. Not all modern reactors use graphite, though. Some of the moderators used today are normal water, sometimes called light water. And the reason it's called light water is so we can oppose it to heavy water. Heavy water is, uh, a molecule, uh, is, is water in which all the hydrogen has been replaced with deuterium. Deuterium is an isotope of hydrogen that has an atomic mass of two. So one proton, one neutron. 
It's a better moderator than life water, but it's harder to come by. Graphite is still used in some reactors. And finally, we have uh, beryllium oxide, which is uh, also able to behave like a moderator. Uh, one thing that uh, Chicago Pile 1 did not have was a coolant to cool the whole thing down. In modern reactors, coolants are used to prevent the core from melting because they get so hot otherwise. The most commonly used coolant is water, just because it's easy to get. And other, includes, uh, other coolants include heavy water, which, as I said, is a little bit harder to come by than ordinary water. Liquid sodium, which is a good carrier of heat. It's a metal, so it conducts. And helium, uh, which can be cooled down to very low temperatures in order to help cool things down. So reactors are shielded with, uh, for example, concrete or lead to protect the workers from the radiation, which I am sure you'll agree is very important. Uh, the core and shielding system are enclosed in a cylindrical building and the reason for that is because uh, a cylindrical building gives a good solid structure in case there's a nuclear meltdown. So if something goes wrong with the coolant and the systems fail and the coolant starts heating up and can't cool down the core anymore, the core may get hot enough to melt the fuel rods and the control rods and you won't be able to withdraw the control rods to a or insert control rods to stop the rate of reaction anymore. So the reaction will become uncontrolled, everything will get very, very hot and start to melt. You might even get an explosion happening. And so a cylindrical building is very good at withstanding these explosions. So if everything goes wrong, at least you're still containing it in some way. Uh, so the overall structure of a nuclear power plant is pretty much the same as the overall structure of a coal power plant, which I'm sure we've learned about before. The only difference is that instead of burning coal to get heat, to heat water, to turn a turbine, we use the fission of uranium to get heat, to heat water, to make steam, to turn a turbine. So other than that, it's pretty much the same. So nuclear reactions tend to produce far more energy than chemical combustion. This little handful of uranium pellets in the photograph produces about the, the same amount of energy as the huge mountain of coal in the background. So you can see that there is uh, quite a lot of uh, efficiency uh, in the difference between the, the two sorts of heat generation. So here we have a diagram of a nuclear reactor. You can, uh, if you know what a coal reactor schematic might look like, you can see some of the similarities here. So we have water that's being heated to form steam. The steam turns a turbine, which turns a generator. The steam is then condensed and recycled into the system. So in a coal reactor, uh, we have a burner here where coal is burned uh, to create heat that'll make the steam. In this case, instead of that, we have this structure over here, a nuclear reactor. So the fuel rods and control rods are inserted over here, and the coolant takes the heat from the reactor to heat up the water. Uh, the reason that uh, we don't just stick the nuclear reactor over here is because the coolant can become radioactive over long periods of time. Well, you don't want the steam here to become radioactive. And that's why we've got two separate systems around here. You can see, though, that aside from the presence of the reactor, it's pretty much the same structure as a conventional power plant. All right, well, that's the end of the theory. So we've learned about nuclear power plants, uh, nuclear reactors, how they work, and how they're different to the first nuclear reactor. Let's go on to some questions. Question one, what is the usual composition of the fuel rods in a nuclear reactor? So we have a few options here, let's go through them. We'll start with the bottom one, plutonium. Now plutonium is not in fact a primary fuel in most reactors. It's uh, quite hard to come by because it's not very common in nature. The easiest way to create plutonium is to bombard uranium for a while. Uh, and so in fact, 
it's far easier to acquire uranium, either of the other two sorts mentioned, than it is to find plutonium. If we look at A, it says pellets of uranium-238. Now, 238 is the most common form of uranium in nature, but it's not very fissile. We don't get, uh, it's not very easy to cause it to undergo nuclear fission. And so it's not really ideal for nuclear reactors. Option B reads pellets of uranium and plutonium. And this is in fact not the case. Uh, the fuel is only one element. And so our, correct, our last option, the correct answer is C, pellets of uranium-238 enriched with uranium-235. And this is the correct answer. Remember that uranium-235 is a much more fissile fuel. So if we have lots of uranium-235, we don't need as much uranium-238. So we can get uh, a better efficiency from the reactor. Question two, which of the following is not used as a moderator? So remember the first moderator used in uh, a nuclear reactor was graphite, but today nuclear reactors use different moderators. We have a few of them over here. So I'll quickly go through them. Light water is used as a moderator sometimes. It's normal water, hydrogen and oxygen, or hydrogen one, I should say. Heavy water, which is hydrogen two and oxygen, or deuterium and oxygen. And so this weighs slightly more than ordinary water, as you would guess. It's a good moderator. Beryllium oxide is used as a moderator in some reactors, not quite as commonly as uh, water. And our last option is sulfuric acid, and this is in fact the correct answer because it's never used as a moderator. One of the reasons for this uh, is that uh, it would sort of start to eat away at the uh, fuel rods. In fact, you can react things like uranium with sulfuric acid to get ural sulfate and so on. So if we use sulfuric acid, not only would it be a bad moderator, but it might damage the reactor itself. Question three, what transformations of energy occur in a nuclear power plant? So in this case, we're going to have to follow the transformations that the energy makes as it turns from nuclear power into electricity. So it shouldn't be too hard because, as I said, the operation of a nuclear power plant is very close to the operation of a coal power plant. So to start with, uh, we don't have chemical combustion energy, we have nuclear energy. So we have the nuclear energy in the atomic nuclei of the uranium. And what happens to that? Well, uranium undergoes fission, and that means that we get lots of heat coming out and lots of neutrons coming out. Uh, which gives us a lot of kinetic energy. Now the heat and the kinetic energy of the neutrons is transferred to, that's right, uh, the coolant and the steam in the system. So the coolant heats up uh, the water in the system, the water boils into steam. Uh, the steam turns turbines, so now we have a transformation into kinetic energy. And finally, the turbines spin a generator which produces electrical energy. So we go through quite a, a few different stages, but we end up uh, with the electric uh, electricity that we need. Question four. What part of a nuclear reactor absorbs excess neutrons and why? Now the answer here is of course the, the objects that absorb neutrons in all nuclear reactors. And those are control rods. The reason that they do this is because if they don't absorb a whole bunch of neutrons, we'll get an uncontrolled nuclear reaction that will grow exponentially. We need to limit the number of neutrons in the system uh, because otherwise the reaction will go out of control and uh, we'll have more energy than we can handle. We can get a meltdown or explosion or something like that. Question five. Describe as many differences as possible between nuclear power plants and coal power plants. Now I know I was harping on before about the similarities between nuclear power plant and coal power plant, but here it says to describe as many differences as possible. So we're gonna need at least about three, right? Uh, well, the first one is the most obvious one. Nuclear power plants use a different fuel. 
they use nuclear reactions instead of uh, chemical combustion. That means that we need a different type of ore to mine. So instead of mining ores of coal, we'll mine ores of uranium. All right, so there's one difference. Uh, what's another difference that we can think of? Oh, hang on. Uh, radiation shielding. The reactors have to be constructed differently. We can't just uh, plop a burner in and put a whole bunch of uh, coal fuel into it. We have to actually construct uh, safety uh, structures, things like radiation shielding made of concrete or lead, so that the workers don't get harmed by all the radiation. Uh, I can think of one more uh, for this slide, and this has to do with the products. So nuclear power plants produce radioactive waste products instead of uh, lots of smoke and carbon dioxide. And it's very hard to dispose of this uh, nuclear waste. It means that you could argue that although it doesn't produce as many greenhouse gases, for example, uh, it does produce harmful waste products that we need to get rid of somehow. All right, so that's the end of the questions. So in this section, we've learned about nuclear reactors and some of the common moderators and control rods that are used as well as the fuel differences between today's nuclear reactors and the first nuclear reactor.